Um, what I'm talking about today is um, a bunch of different trends in software development. Um, as a builder of cost models, and specifically cost models associated with estimating the cost of software development, a lot of the time that we spend in our cost research department is looking at new and emerging trends in the areas where we want to be able to forecast cost. So I thought this was kind of a good uh, lightweight way of uh, sharing some of the knowledge that we've learned over the last few years about some of the technologies in software development. So um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of a refresher on technology just to sort of remind us all where we've come from because, you know, certainly in my lifetime, we've come a really long way with respect to technology and specifically with software development technology. And then I'm going to talk about some new and emerging concepts. Some of these things aren't all that new, but they're emerging. They're still, the industry is still getting their head around them. Some of them are really very new. Uh, the specific concepts that I'll talk about, I'll talk about web application frameworks, service-oriented architecture, cloud computing, and a little bit about big data and what that is and where that might be taking us, mobile application development, um, and then model-driven architectures. So those are the five concepts that I'm going to touch on briefly. I'll give a brief description of what it is, talk about what some of the benefits or, or challenges associated with each of the concepts are, and then I'll conclude with some final thoughts. So let's start by thinking about technology. So in 1983, um, I apologize, it's a little bit of a high chart, but in 1983, Motorola introduces the first handheld cellular phone, and it weighed about two and a half pounds. It was about the size of a man's head. You could store a whopping 30 phone numbers. It took 10 hours to recharge, and for that 10 hours, you were able to sustain about an hour of conversation before having to recharge again. So let's jump ahead to 2007 and think about um, the introduction of the iPhone. We've now taken, you know, all the gadgets. I like to say all the gadgets our teenagers can't live without, and integrated them all into one small device that fits in your pocket, including cell phones, web browsers, you can listen to music, books on tape, on tape, books on your iPhone. Uh, it's got a camera embedded and so forth and so on. And in 2011, the iPhone 5 became available with the near field communi communication technology, so you really can just pay your bills with a credit card up close to the machine, um, updated operating system, streaming music, GPS, 4G connectivity, um, and I talk about the iPhone, but all of the all of the um, providers of cell phone technology have similar smartphones that are available, as well as you can now get a tablet that does everything your iPhone does and more. So, um, software. Uh, my motivation for this talk really is that uh, you know if you look at people that are interested in software process and measurement, um, like the estimators and the process improvement people you know, the measurement people across the board, many of them actually started their careers in software development. And, you know, that makes sense. It makes sense. People that understand software development are the people that are going to be able to help companies improve their processes, help companies get their head around software project planning, things like that. But as you move into software measurement and process, you move a little bit out of the trenches where you're, you know, doing hand-to-hand -hand combat with um, the latest technology of the day. So, you know, you hear about these new concepts and buzzwords, they, you know, they emerge with head-spinning regularity, as, as I say on the slide, um, but maybe as, as your career has progressed, you've moved away from being completely up-to-date on what, what all these buzzwords mean, because your focus has been on other things. So my thought is this is probably a useful topic to put in front of the software measurement community to help people who have moved a little bit out of the trenches of day-to-day -day software development, but who still need to understand what the software developers are talking about. So the first concept or technology that I chose to talk about is web application frameworks. So and anybody who used to build Windows applications back in the day know that the first window applications, Windows applications were really, really hard to develop because there wasn't a lot of technology wrapped around being able to build window applications. 
The same was true when the first people started to develop web applications. Um, we started out using HTML, um, and I have actually, I'll admit, programmed a little bit of HTML, and I'm very bad at it. Um, it's very hard to do. It's not hard to do. It's tedious. And, you know, we use CGI as a gateway um, over time. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, because HTML is tedious and just very hard to work with, new languages were developed specifically for the web, such as PHP, Cold Fusion. And these languages greatly improved the productivity with which web application developers could, A, develop web applications, and B, develop web applications that met all of the requirements that the Internet-savvy wor world has of the websites that they want to visit. Web application frameworks are basically like an SDK, a software development kit for web application development. So it's sort of the next generation of web languages that adds capabilities that all web developers or most web developers would need. So um, there, there's a bunch of different web application development tools out there, and I don't, you know, I have icons for some of them, not all of them, just because I only had space for some of them. But, you know, you've heard about Catalyst or Ruby on Rails or web objects. So these are all different applications that a web developer could use to, to ease the development of their web applications. And some of the features that are included, caching, so commonly used data can be um, put into a cache so that the website appears more responsive as users are accessing different pieces of the website. Anybody who's developing a website needs to put some level, probably needs to put some level or wants to put some level of security, whether it's user access codes or whether it's limiting, restricting access to a per certain part of the websites for people who meet some particular criteria. Um, so there's security features. There's templating so that you can design, you know, commonly used templates and substitute different data as the requests change or the searches for information. The ability to maintain your data in a persistent and reliable fashion. The uh, web application frameworks provide the capability to map a URL so that instead of it being some long-winded address that you actually need to get to another place on the web, it's, you know, click here for X, Y, Z, or it's just a simple looking URL that then gets mapped to the more complicated one. So it makes for a more pleasant user experience. These frameworks also provide uh, some administrative tools. So for if, for example, you're building a website and you need to ask someone to enter a date, instead of it, it would have a control that brings up a little calendar. So administrative tools to just basically do some of the things that web developers have to do, would have to do fairly regularly in their code, if not for having these tools built into the framework, or these capabilities, I should say. So why would somebody want to use this? First of all, you, you are allowed to have increased abstraction, or it creates increased abstraction, meaning that the web developer actually gets to spend more time thinking about solving business problems with their web development instead of solving the problems that have to be solved before you can solve the business problems to make the website work and function in a way that the market expects. <coughs> You're going to see increased time to market. Once, once you've learned how to use a web application framework, you're not going to go from being an HTML developer to pumping applications out really fast when you go to Ruby on Rails until you obviously learn Ruby on Rails. But once you do, it should increase your time to market as well as your development productivity. It creates a more easily reusable code. Um, it helps to enforce best practices as far as uh, sort of normalizing the kind of things or not normalizing, but creating an environment to deliver the kind of website interfaces that the public has grown to expect 